with all of the real spiritual traditions, is that unless one is born with a mediumistic talent and has that as something from childhood, and there are people who are born with various psychic talents, and mediumship is one, unless one is born with that as a natural talent, one should avoid any kind of opening oneself to any kind of entity because the entities that hang around the earth plane who would want to communicate in a mediumistic way are just not helpful. No spiritual master communicates mediumistically. And there are a lot of details about why that's so. But no true spiritual master is in the astral plane. The masters are in spiritual planes way beyond that. And they don't communicate that way. Well, what about the Book of Miracles? That, to me, is a very... Yes, it, it came through that way. Um, there are a number of things. There's the, uh, the Course in Miracles. There's also a book called Testimony of Light, which is uh, not... It's the same kind of transmission. Uh, there are some that are very nice um, and very helpful sometimes. For the most part, and this is not true for Course in Miracles, but for Testimony of Light, the communication is between two friends who are in the physical. One of them dies, and they continue their relationship so that they know who it is that they're really relating to. Uh, and, that's a, and that's a different kind of a situation. Um, and again, of course, ultimately, the test is to see what comes through. You know, if you have something like the Course of Miracles comes through, well, the fruits are, are pretty good there. But as a general rule, what I was describing is, I've seen it just too many times. Yes? Has there been much effort to create an environment similar to like the fourth phase of, of the astral plane, which would be um, dealing with uh, learning and resting and just general spiritual growth itself? Other than, say, maybe the Maya civilization. You mean on in the physical? On the earth, yes. Well, in one sense, there would be no point to it. And the reason that I say that is that one way of thinking of what happens during that phase in the astral is that there's deep study that goes on, deep spiritual study. If you think of that as the study phase, then what physical life is, is the test, the examination, to see how much of what we've been studying we can actually live out and actualize. Mm -hmm. To just study when we're in the physical is neat, but it's not the point of what the physical can offer us. So there's a balancing between the deep study on the one hand, and then the trying to apply it to specific concrete life experiences, and see whether you can get it just out of your feeling thought into action. Okay, but like dealing with the Aquarius... It looks like somebody official has a question, and I think we better... Uh, yes, I hate to break this up. We're running a little bit over the deadline, so you have to break Oh, is this room going to be used, Stephanie? Yes, it's one of Oh, it is. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yes. I have um, a few copies of the book that I wrote, which goes into a little bit more detail from what I talked about. It's 266, and there are some copies of the continuum book, which is 375, and then there's some free materials that may have bought. Are you speaking tomorrow? No, tomorrow I'm going to be talking about reincarnation and more about what I talked about in terms of reincarnation and the spiritual. Can we ask questions tomorrow? Oh, I guess I can. We'll see what happens. Through, what I discovered was that uh, no one at any of the educational institutions that I was aware of, anyway, were, were willing to deal with any of the <coughs> spiritual or esoteric dimensions of human knowledge or of religion. And even in programs in religious studies, the kind of work that's done is strictly of a historical uh, level or a theological and very intellectual level. But there's really no interest at all uh, in mystical teaching and no respect at all for esoteric knowledge. And even when there are individual courses here and there in mysticism or in comparative mysticism, the work tends to be, the presentations tend to be so totally scholarly and historical that the real <laughs> essence of it is just totally lost. And 
I remember uh, as a graduate student wanting to um, TA, be a teaching assistant in, a, in the only undergraduate class that they had at Harvard at the time. And um, the instructor told me that if there were enough students in the course that he would have an extra section and I could be the TA in it. And I went there and there was a hall, one of the largest halls at, at Harvard Yard, and it was packed. I'd never seen a, a room more filled. And people were literally streaming in the halls and, and waiting outside in the hall. And I'd never seen that in all the, you know, in all my college years. And the instructor gets up and there's a real sense of anticipation. This is the only religion course in the yard. And he gets up and he says, some people think that religion has to do with subjective experiences and that it's all a matter of, of spiritual things. But in fact, religion can be studied scientifically and objectively just like anything else. And this course is going to be that kind of an objective study of religion. And I didn't get my TA job because so many people walked out and did not end up registering, withdrew from the course. Um, because there is a hunger, and there is a hunger, uh, but it just isn't being satisfied at most universities. Uh, having experienced that myself, seven years ago, a couple of friends and I started an institute at John F. Kennedy University called the Institute for Mystical and Parapsychological Studies. And what our goal has been is to develop an academic context, and I'll put it differently, to develop a context within academia for the study of mystical teachings, psychic phenomena, and parapsychology, and to do so in a way that is not purely intellectual, though of course that's there too, but where there's at least a striving for a balance between the head and the heart where the basic recognition is that all of these kinds of subjects have to do with intuition, aspiration, inspiration, and the kinds of understanding that go way beyond what ordinarily uh, is recognized as legitimate in American higher education. Um, what has developed from very, very small beginnings are two undergraduate majors one in mysticism and one in parapsychology. And then recently we have now started the only accredited graduate curricula in comparative mysticism, in parapsychology, in transpersonal counseling. And we're about to start a fourth track of this program in consciousness and the arts uh, this coming fall. And so the work that I've done has been in the context of, on the one hand, being a university professor on the other hand, uh, not being a university professor. Um, so that's a little bit of the professional background to supplement for those of you who were there yesterday, my personal quest that would have led me to express outwardly in this sort of way. Um, the topic for today is reincarnation. <clears throat> and I noticed in the program that it says the true picture. <laughs> and I did not name it that. Uh, in fact, just this morning I was talking with uh, Elmer Green and uh, he was telling me how a friend of his had, uh, as a young man, had been very interested in these various uh, roaming uh, evangelical preachers. And one circuit day... Riders. What? The circuit, circuit riders. riders. Right. We have circuit riders nowadays, too, where they go to big conferences. But these circuit <laughs> riders were, had their own tents that they carried with them. And uh, he went into one of these tents, and there were all these pictures that were de depictions of hell. And there was fire and brimstone and all of these things. And the, uh, the preacher said, this is what hell looks like. It's the true picture. <laughs> and the fellow said, well, you know, how do you know? I mean, what's, you know, who got it? Where did it come from? And he says, well, I was there and I saw it and I brought these back. And uh, so the true picture of hell <laughs> was presented there, and the true picture of reincarnation. <laughs> and there was not a scent of smoke on it. <laughs> uh, before I begin with the kind of material that I, I do want to present today, I would like to just get a sense of 
where each one of you is at. Now, we're not going to be able to go around the room as I did yesterday and ask you individually to say something about it, but um, let me ask the following questions and see what the distribution is. As a university professor, I'm, I like surveys, right? I mean, you've got to be scientific, so you take surveys. So I'm going to take a survey, and we're going to use a scale, and the scale goes from 1 to 10. Um, and I'll ask a question, for example, do you believe in ESP? And if you are absolutely positive that ESP is nonsense, and that there's no such thing, you're a number one on the scale. And if you're absolutely positive that ESP is for real, you're a number ten on the scale. Okay? If you don't know, if you haven't made up your mind, you don't know, or if you're not telling, you're a number five. Okay, so that's the scale. So let's start it with the ESP question. How many of you, do you believe in ESP? How many ones do we have? Are we doing this by fingers? Yeah, raise your hand. <laughs> Twos, threes, fours, fives, sixes, sevens, eights, nines, Oh, yeah. tens. <laughs> okay. How about, I mean, obviously, we're going to hit the same kind of thing with life after death if you're in a reincarnation seminar, but let's try it out. Life after death. You believe in life after death. One means definitely not. Ten means you're certain that at death we do continue to exist in some form or another. Ones, twos, threes, fours. Fives, sixes, sevens, eights, nines, tens. Okay, and now, reincarnation. Okay, same pattern. Number five means you don't know, or you're not sure, or you're not telling. How many ones do we have? Okay, ones means you're sure it's not so. Twos, threes, fours, fives, sixes, Sevens, eights, nines, tens. All righty. You know, sometimes when there's so many tens, I feel like it's not even worth talking because it's like talking to myself. So I'm glad to see that there are some ones and twos so that in fives it makes the whole thing worthwhile. Um, another question, and this, there's no scale. I don't think. How many of you have uh, been through some... Uh, how many of you have had... Psychic past life readings. Okay, that's just a yes or no question. Have had a reading from someone who claimed to give a psychic past life reading. Okay, how many of you have had spontaneous past life memories? Okay, and how many of you have been through some one form or another of a regression process? Uh, okay, and just to get a clear picture, how many of you have answered yes to one of those last three questions. Okay. All righty. Um, there are two things that I'd like to do today. One of which is to place the whole phenomenon of reincarnation into a little bit wider context and look at the question not just how does it work and what is reincarnation but what for because one can understand the mechanics of something like reincarnation and understand the basic principle of the law of karma but not really understand or have a sense of the full context in which reincarnation as a process is going on so that's one thing which I prefer. The other one is to talk a little bit about the value, or perhaps lack of value, or the relative value of finding out about our past lives. Because one of the things that has come up uh, in the last two, three years is that there's a greater and greater interest in probing into one's past lives. You look very official. Uh, Are you here on an official mission? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I'm just taking a couple pictures of something. Okay. So I just keep going and you'll do Go your... Ahead. Okay. I'm not here. All right. Um, 
there's been a tendency for people to want to explore or understand not only reincarnation as a universal principle, but to get into the specifics of their own past lives. And there are several ways of doing this. One, of course, is to get a past life reading from someone who claims to be psychic and be able to provide that kind of a reading. Another way is through hypnotic regression techniques. Uh, and then a third way, of course, is just when those kinds of things come spontaneously as past life memories. And what I'll be doing toward the end of the session, after I've filled out the context for really understanding what reincarnation is all about, um, I want to talk about those kinds of issues of what past life information is good for, because it is good for something, and also what past life information may not be so good for, because it also is not good for some other things. And there's a tendency, particularly in the first rush of excitement, of finding out that this all this is for real and that it is possible to get past life memories, uh, there's a tendency to glamorize that whole process, to glamorize reg the regression process, and to ignore or not be aware of the other side of it, which is information that might lead one to perhaps hold back a little. So that's kind of a survey of, of the, what I'll be talking about. Um, let's start off trying to if you have a question as I'm talking, raise your hand and let's see what happens if I work with questions as I'm talking. If it turns out to be too disruptive to the flow of the material, then we'll just wait for the questions until the end. Okay, one of the things that is important to understand about reincarnation is that the process of reincarnation is not an isolated process that's kind of divorced from other universal processes. But in all of the esoteric traditions, in all of the mystical traditions, the reincarnation process is viewed as being one of five major cosmic or universal processes. And in order to understand how reincarnation fits into the whole divine scheme of things, it's important to have some kind of an understanding of what role reincarnation as one particular process plays in the scheme of, of all of creation. So what I would like to do before specifically looking at reincarnation as a, uh, of how it works in terms of the law of karma, is to just mention what those five universal processes are. The first one is the creation process. And what that has to do with is the manifestation of the universe from the original undifferentiated one. And this is spoken of, of course, in terms of the creation of the universe from God, or from the Oversoul, or from the Beyond Beyond, or from the Ultimate Reality, or from the Undifferentiated Tao. I mean, different traditions talk about the unitive, original state of the universe with different names, but it's all the same. There's In every tradition, there's there's whatever there was before the beginning of creation, before the beginning of manifestation, there is the one. And the first of the universal processes is the creation process, or the process of manifestation, where out of this unity, out of the Oversoul, out of God, there emerges everything that eventually takes on the form of the universe that we're right in the middle of. There emerges mind as universal mind. There emerges energy as manifested universal energy. 
and there emerges matter as the universal body of the universe. Now, we certainly don't have time to look at the particular dynamic that's described as taking place uh, in that creation process, but there are various traditions that have really done a lot of work in trying to explain what it is that goes on in that particular process. Let me just say that the purpose of creation, the purpose of manifestation in every one of these traditions is to enable their, in, to enable the original reality, the soul, the oversoul, God, to become self-conscious, to have, to gain knowledge of itself, himself, herself. At that point, there are no male-female distinctions. And you might ask, I mean, many of you have probably heard this, that the creation is there in order to allow God to be conscious of himself. And you might ask, you know, how does, why? Why would that be the way it would work? And in thinking this through, I came up with the following analogy. Um, in one sense, all of the knowledge that we gain about ourselves works through a process of objectification. It's by objectifying ourselves that we learn about ourselves. And I'll give you an example. I found many times that I've had certain qualities, certain ways of looking at things or attitudes or behavior patterns that I've not known about, that I've not been conscious of, that I've been unconscious of. Even though they're part of me, I'm just not aware that I'm that way. And I'm sure all of you have seen that either in yourselves or in someone else, that there can be, they can do all sorts of things, or you can do all sorts of things that you're not aware that you're even doing. And what I realized one time was that the way that I gain self-consciousness and self-knowledge is by one day seeing someone else doing that very same thing and going, boy, that's really ugly. <laughs> or usually in terms of focus, it's something that we start off being critical about. And being critical and seeing it outside of ourselves. And then after a while, at a certain point, having gotten a clear picture of what it is out there, seeing that, hey, that's what I do too. I just did such and such. Hey, that's like so and so when they do such and such. I'm like that. I have that quality and I never even realized it. And so much of the process of gaining self-knowledge is requires having oneself objectified in order to perceive it as something other than oneself and then identify with it as actually having been a part of oneself or being a part of oneself. I know this is very abstract, but I hope that you can kind of follow this. Well, in the esoteric traditions, what they say is that it's the exact same thing with God, with the original oversoul, that there was everything there except for self-knowledge, except for consciousness. And that the only way that that consciousness could emerge and develop was by the infinite, undifferentiated one projecting out of itself kind of a shadow of itself, a mirror of itself, in order for that objectification process to take place. And again, I know this is very abstract, but that's some of the thinking and some of the teaching that's involved in literally every one of the esoteric traditions that I've studied. So that's the first process, is the creation process. And the purpose behind it is the development of consciousness, and particularly the self-consciousness of God to be able to know I am God have that state of God self-conscious realization. Once the universe comes into being, and again, I have to kind of jump over some things that would help tie all of this together, but um, we just don't have the time to do that. In the original, in the beginning of the creation, 
before the evolution of human form or animal forms or even plant forms, in the first manifestation of the gaseous forms and the stone forms, there is said to be consciousness, but very, very finite consciousness. In other words, let me ask you this. How many of you think that rocks are conscious? Just a couple of people. Okay, well, in the West, our materialistic view of things, the physicalistic view that's developed uh, over the past several hundred years, has set up a very strong duality between those things which are conscious, which are basically human and maybe some of the animals, and those things which are not conscious, which is everything else. In the esoteric traditions, consciousness is seen to be a basic characteristic of everything. It is the basic building block of everything. <coughs> and the difference between a stone and a plant and a lion and a human is not that one has consciousness and the other doesn't. It's that one has a greater degree of consciousness than the other. And that what one has in rocks, whether they are pet rocks or not, or wild rocks. <laughs> wild. <laughs> Heavy. <laughs> is that there is consciousness that corresponds to the sensitivity of the particular body. I agree with you, this is heavy. <laughs> <laughs> and let me describe this a little bit more. <clears throat> what allows consciousness to grow, to develop, to expand, is the sensitivity of the form, of the body, that the consciousness is in. So that in, for example, a human form, with all of our senses and the, and the various sensitivities of our physical body, there's enormous range for the consciousness to be very expansive. In animal forms, the animal form allows a certain range of co different kinds of experiences that the consciousness can can work through and can develop through, but it's much more limited than a human form. And so on down the line, so that when you get down to rock form, what kinds of sensitivity does a rock have? Very little. Perhaps there would be the body of the rock, the rock form could perhaps impress on the consciousness that's developing a sense of, <clears throat> I have solidity, of density. And you can imagine certain kinds of impressions that if consciousness were associated with a rock form, that would be impressed on the consciousness. Now, from the moment of creation, which is a creation of the most finite consciousness, associated with gaseous forms and, and rock forms, the task for consciousness at that point is to expand, to develop to become capable of being infinite. Because if God is infinite, the consciousness that is going to know itself as God has to also be infinite. So that the task for consciousness after creation, after the first manifestation, is to expand, is to evolve. And so the second universal process is the evolutionary process. And it, it's carried out by the evolution of consciousness through the evolution of higher and higher bodily forms. And you can see what this does in relation to Darwinism. It is parallel to Darwin's view of evolution, except it flips it upside down. Because in Darwin's view, the form develops and consciousness is a side effect that just happens to be there at a certain point. In the esoteric teachings, it's consciousness that needs to develop and it's consciousness that's creating these new forms in order to be able to expand. 
And one way that I've kind of pictured this for myself is if you think of consciousness in its original form as a balloon that's completely empty, a shriveled up little balloon, the experiences that are had from lifetime to lifetime in different and higher forms is like stuffing that balloon full of experiences which makes the balloon have to expand to be able to contain the experiences. And what happens is that consciousness expands in order to absorb and contain different impressions, different experiences. Are you getting the picture or is this... Yes? Okay. Now, one of the basic tenets of these various esoteric traditions is that it is one and the same consciousness that transmigrates through this evolutionary sequence. So it's not like in Darwinism where you have one animal and then it dies and that's the end of the consciousness and the life that's connected with that particular animal. But the task of the evolution of consciousness is that one soul, one drop soul, connected with its consciousness, evolves through different forms. And the process of the evolution of consciousness is this consciousness associating with one form and then dying, dissociating from that form, then associating with the next higher form, then dissociating from that, associating with the next higher, and so forth. So that it's one, as it were, <coughs> bubble of consciousness, which through the evolutionary process is gaining greater and greater and greater consciousness. Anybody have questions about that picture? Why yes. wouldn't we start running out of rocks? Why wouldn't we? Because the process is continuous. It's not a static thing that happened once and that's it. It's a dynamic process just that's continuing. With new souls. With new souls coming out and new finite bits of consciousness continually going through this process. The whole thing is in process. It's not a once and for all kind of creation picture. Yes? Could you compare um, the Darwin and the, the Darwinian theory and the esoteric theory once again? Okay. The basic premise of Darwinism well, there's several. One is that it's mat. Well, let's see. The ones that matter are that Darwinism views the evolution of form as the thing that's really happening. And it just so happens that consciousness develops as a side effect. In the esoteric view, it is consciousness which is the basic reality. And it is because of the needs of consciousness that the forms come to be developed. Okay, so it just turns that right upside down. And then there's some other differences, but that's the key one. Yes? Does this work all the way up through the human form also? Okay, now here's where we get to the human form, which is the next step. The evolutionary process is said to stop with the attainment of human form. Because human, with the attainment of the human form, the consciousness, let me put it, let me try to find it, the best way of putting it. With the attainment of human form, consciousness is full and complete. Now, you might say, now, impossible, I'm not full and complete. But listen for a moment and you'll see what the issue is. Okay, the second process is the evolutionary process up to human form. With the attainment of human form, consciousness is full and complete, and the bodies which have been developing are as sensitive and as developed as they need to be in order to provide the experience of God realization. And when I said bodies, what I'm referring to is the fact that in esoteric tradition, in esoteric teachings, they talk about not just the physical body being what we have here, 
this physical body won't do it for us. But what they say is that in addition to the physical body, we have two other bodies. And they're given various names, but the ones that I find most useful is to talk about the subtle body or the energy body and the mental body. And with the attainment of human form, there is full consciousness of the physical body, but as of yet, not yet consciousness of either the energy body or the mental body, even though those two bodies are fully developed. So that the attainment of human form, and when they talk about, you know, I mean, you've heard this so many times, that the human being is the pinnacle of creation. The human being is the microcosm in the macrocosm. And there are lots of different ways of talking about this. Uh, the point is that with the attainment of human form, what is attained is the complete physical form, subtle form, and mental form, which are necessary in order to complete the original purpose of God consciousness. Now you might ask, if the consciousness is complete, and if our bodies are full, even if we're not aware of these other two levels of our bodies, then why aren't we happy? Why is all this seeking that continues? And the answer to that is that even though the consciousness is full, that instead of being focused upon the soul or upon God, the consciousness is diverted or distracted and is focused on all of those impressions and experiences which were the means by which the consciousness developed. Okay, in other words, remember that balloon analogy, that through the creation, different impressions were picked up along the way, rock form, the plant form, the various kind of animal forms. And it was through those impressions and experiences being contained in the mind that the consciousness had to expand in order to, to contain those impressions. Well, what happens is that the consciousness is full, but instead of being free to focus wherever it would want to focus, the consciousness has become so identified with all of these animal impressions and all of these experiences that it is riveted to those, and so it's bound. And being bound, it's not able to be God conscious, it's worldly conscious. And then at this point, a new task is presented to consciousness, which is no longer the evolution of consciousness, which has been completed, but the liberation of consciousness. And the third process begins, which is intended to free consciousness from the accumulated stuff that we have gone through and picked up in our evolutionary journey. The way that that stuff is experienced is as instincts and as any of those kinds of bodily identifications, the identification with the physical body and all of the bodily forces and instinctual forces that are our inheritance from that evolutionary phase. And so the task now is to break that identification of consciousness with the body in order to allow the consciousness to refocus and identify with its own soul rather than with its body. There must be some questions about that. No? Okay. Yes. And this consciousness that we progress to the human form through, we have experienced the animal realm, the plant realm. That's right. What this is saying 
I mean, you, what this is saying is that by the time someone attains human form and human consciousness, they have experienced being every lower form in creation. And what's more, everything around us is consciousness on that same evolutionary path leading toward human consciousness at its own particular level at the moment. That's right, that's what that picture is. Yes? What evidence do we have to that would substantiate the fact that you reincarnate from a lower form. Oh, well, right now we're not talking at the level of evidence. We're talking at the, I'm reporting about es what, what are the teachings of esoteric traditions. I'm sorry. That's all right. Um, okay, now, yes. Is there an explanation in the teachings where the original uh, essence comes from once it's gotten here? Like, if there is a certain amount of energy in the world and then there is a transference from one form to another, mm -hmm. um, the changes it goes out. Well, at the beginning point, where does that come from? <laughs> the very beginning point? Yeah. That's part of, um, that is talked about, and that's part of the mechanics, as it were, of how the universe, the metaphysics of, of how the universe is constructed and what the dynamics of it are. And we just don't, I just can't get into that today. But I can give you some references afterwards if you want to look into that. Okay. Now, here is where we're up to the third process, right? The third of the universal processes. It's this third process which involves reincarnation. <clears throat> Because it is through the reincarnation process and through the experience of reincarnation in human form that the identification, that the absorption in these earlier experiences gets broken. And I'll give you an example of that. One of the things that we inherit as human beings from our journey through the creation is a tendency to identify very strongly with the physical body. Our consciousness functions through the physical body, and because of that, the physical body is the focal point of all of our activity. Identify with the physical body. Now, reincarnation from the largest cosmic perspective that I'm presenting all of this in, the purpose of reincarnation is to break that identification. And not only the identification with the body, but the other identifications that we have with the different qualities and characteristics that we might manifest at a given moment. And I'll give you an example of how that works. Let's say, let's take a single lifetime, and let's take the 1920s, let's take the 1920s and someone who was quite wealthy and who identified himself or herself with being a wealthy person. I am rich. Let's say, let's take a single lifetime, and let's take the 1920s, let's take the 1920s, and someone who was quite wealthy and who identified himself or herself with being a wealthy person. I am rich. The stock market crashes. There are some people in that situation who are so identified with their wealth and with their lifestyles that when they see all of that crumble away, it's as though they no longer exist and jumping out the window is, makes perfect sense because it's as though they no longer exist. Because the identification with a certain situation, a certain circumstance of life is so strong that they can't even imagine themselves not being that way. There are other people who perhaps had a strong identification with being wealthy, with the situation, the circumstance, but it wasn't strong enough to make them want to kill themselves. So they go through the depression, and during that whole period, being very poor, they then identify themselves and say, I am poor. And again, because of the circumstance, the situation, 
and the tendency of consciousness to identify with whatever is coming through consciousness at the moment, then there's a feeling, I am poor. And that's who I am. You ask the person, who are you? I'm someone who, who doesn't have any money. I lost my money. I'm poor. Then imagine in the 40s and 50s, the same person, again, making money and becoming wealthy and saying, I am rich. You go through that long enough, and at a certain point, there's bound to be the thought come up, now wait a minute, here I am, and in one circumstance I think I'm rich, and then I'm poor, and then I'm rich, and then I'm poor. Who's the I? I'm not the circumstance that's either rich or poor. I'm whoever is having these experiences. And the way that Consciousness frees itself from total absorption and identification with, with the world of circumstance is by going through the opposites of experience sufficiently that you can no longer just buy into one fragmentary piece of the whole. Because if you think you're rich, then you're not poor and you're identifying with a particular piece and that's a limitation. Reincarnation functions the same way, but over many more lifetimes. And we'll take the experience of being male. And remember I said one of the basic things that one starts off with is an identification with the physical body because the body is so central to all of our activities and perceptions. Well, if I identify with my body, that means I identify with the sex of my body. That means that I know I'm a man. And in different cultures, that means different things. But whatever it means, it's not so much the cultural distinctions that matter, it's the fact that there's an identification with being a male. Well, to the extent that I'm identified with that, my consciousness is bound to, is tied to, a particular set of ways of being in the world. Now the particular set, again, may differ in different cultures, but that's not the point. Every culture has its own set for what is permissible, permissible for a male to express and to experience. Same thing with a woman, being in a female body, I'm a woman, and then that channels the consciousness, narrows the consciousness to a particular set also. How is that to be broken? The reincarnation process, where one goes from one form to another form, where there's an alternating, not necessarily every other lifetime, but after a couple of lifetimes in one form of a male, then a couple of lifetimes in the form of a female, that strong self-identification with the sex of one's body is no longer tenable. We've been through too much to be totally thinking of ourselves as just male or just female. And you've noticed, I'm sure, that there are some people who are so totally identified either with being male or being female that it's like they don't have a self apart from their bodily identification. And there are other people who may be in a male body or may be in a female body where that's not what's important where they can experience and sympathize and empathize from within with the experiences of both masculinity and femininity. And this is the kind of freeing of consciousness from circumstance, from matter, which is part of what's required if the spiritual states of God-realization are to be approached. And the reincarnation process has as one of its most basic functions to give one all of the different pieces of life experience. It can be bodily, you know, the sexual thing, it can be having to do with wealth or with power or with fame, and there are lots of pieces. And the pieces are having it, not having it. Uh, being the one who's controlling, the one who's controlled, being the victim or being the, I mean, Pick your favorite situation, and you can see how 
for the most part, we play one piece of the whole action. And every situation is like a dance where there are different parts and different steps, and we tend to get into one of those and think that that's all there is, or that that's all that's important. And the reincarnation process makes us play each of the roles so that we break the identification with the roles. If you've only played one role, the tendency is to get so identified with it and sucked up into it that you start thinking you're Napoleon. <laughs> but if you play the different roles of being the servant of the house and then being the master of the house and being the the lady of the house and being a child in the I mean if you play all the different parts, after a while you know that you're not that. You get into a new role and you say this is just another role. And that is a big accomplishment, to get to the point of breaking the identification with the roles. Now, it does not mean that you don't play roles, and that you don't continue in roles. One of the things that happened in the 60s was that when there was a whole big awakening of the fact that everything was social roles, there was a rejection of all roles, because we saw, you know, like, I'm not my role, and I'm not going to be trapped into being my role, and so you turn your back on the whole thing. Well, that may be necessary as a step in terms of just helping get clear on stuff, but it's not the point of it. The real point is to be able to function in any role that we're given in any lifetime, but in such a way that we can play the role, but without identifying with it. Right? There's an old Sufi story which I think of whenever I say things like I just said, like being in the role but not really being in it, being in the world and not of it. The Sufi story is that there was a um, uh, a teacher and his uh, a Sufi Murshid and his disciple is Murid, and the master took the student, tossed them overboard. They were on a, a ship tossed them overboard into the water and said, I command you not to get your clothes wet. I mean, it's that kind of thing where you're thrown right in the middle of it and yet somehow, who knows how, there's got to be that detachment from playing the role, whether it's a mother, father, university professor, uh, housewife, businessman, new age, this or that, whatever it is, to do it, but without identifying with it. And that's what we learn in the reincarnation process. Now, there are other aspects of the reincarnation process also, which has to do with the law of karma. And what I've been describing is one type of functioning of the law of karma, which is balancing out situations, situational identifications, so then one experiences the whole. Right nowadays, a big word is holistic. Well, that's really the point. And the karmic imbalance occurs when you experience, instead of experiencing a situation holistically, you experience it in terms of a particular self-interest of one piece of it. Then what happens is that sets up a, a rebound effect where you've got to experience the opposite piece in order to complete the whole picture. And basically, that's what re the reincarnation process serves. It serves that function, of that task for consciousness. Uh, now, within that, there are all sorts of variations. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with Gina Sermonara's book, Many Mansions. But it is, without question, the best single study of how the different types of karma and how karma works that I've ever come across. It's based on the Edgar Casey readings. She did just a fabulous, fabulous job. Now that's the third of the universal processes. Once there is an approach, once one gets to the point of not only intellectually understanding this whole thing about freeing oneself from the physical situation, being in the world but not of it, once one approaches that, then a fourth process, universal process, begins. 
And that fourth process has been called the involutionary process. The involution of consciousness. And what is entailed there is that instead of focusing all of one's energy and attention and consciousness toward worldly outward values and circumstances and situations and relationships, that while balancing all of that, right, while still being involved in all of that, there simultaneously is a turn inward, a turning of consciousness to realizing that the source of happiness, the source of knowledge, the source of truth, the source of love, is not going to be found outside of oneself, it's to be found inside, within oneself. Because for many years, many lifetimes, we go around blaming circumstances or other people for what happens to us, or looking to others for happiness, for love, and for all of the goodies that we might want out of life. And one of the biggest problems in marriage, for example, is where each partner is looking to the other to be the source of his or her own happiness. And when they don't produce, which of course you can't, then they blame the other. And as long as one puts out to someone else the responsibility or the task of providing deep understanding and happiness for oneself, it not only won't work, but it's going to end in disillusionment, anger, frustration, and blame. And through the reincarnation process, one of the basic lessons that's learned is that life doesn't work that way. Thank you. 30-minute man has come. Let me just finish this one sequence. That it just doesn't work that way. That all of what we're looking for is within and has to be found within because it can't be found without, outside. At that point, there is what in different traditions is called metanoia, tauba, or verag. Metanoia is a Christian term, which means a change, it means conversion, a changing of mental orientation. The word conversion nowadays is just used to mean whether you became a Baptist from being a Presbyterian or a Methodist from being a Roman Catholic. Originally, metanoia was a term that was used to describe a radical change in state of consciousness. Tauba is the Sufi term, which means literally turning. It's T-A-U-B-A, -A, Tauba. It means turning. And it's that same thing of conversion, turning around, from directing all of one's hopes and aspirations for happiness and for anything one wants outside of oneself to turning inward. And Virag is the Hindu term for renunciation, which does not mean an external renunciation, turning one's back on the world, but it means turning from being consciously oriented toward the world as the source of goodies, renouncing that, and turning towards oneself. So there comes this point, and from that point, up through the spiritual path, are the various experiences that one has, and the various life decisions that one has to face, which has to do with spiritual development, which has to do with finding within oneself that very source of the soul, which is the same as the oversoul, the same as God. Because part of all of this from the very beginning is the view that each one of us is simply a drop of the oversoul, a drop soul of God. And that if we could only get in touch and conscious of that part of us, then we would have all of the bliss all of the knowledge, all of the power, all of the everything that God has. We would have universal love, universal knowledge, universal consciousness.
And it's all this other stuff that is between our consciousness and our true selves. And the spiritual path is nothing other than the various kinds of ups and downs you go through as you try to reclaim your consciousness for yourself. Not for your little selfish self, but for your capital S, deep soul self. Finally, there's a point that's reached where the consciousness has come as far as it can go within the creation, within the universe. And there is a conscious experience and identification of being one with everything in the universe. Not just as an intellectual concept like I'm presenting right now, but there is the, the perception, the consciousness, which is not one moment or another. You know, a lot of people talk about mystical experience, where you have a peak experience, you see it, and then you come down again. There is a state in which that consciousness of total unity of everything in the universe becomes a permanent state of consciousness. And that is the peak of the spiritual path or of the involutionary process. And then there's one final, and it's the fifth, right? I'm up to five now. The fifth of the universal processes is the realization process. And that has to do with jumping that gap from knowing oneself as being one with everything in the universe to being one consciously with God. And that places reincarnation in a little bit broader context than it's usually talked about. There's the creation, the evolution of consciousness, the reincarnational process is the third, the involution process is the fourth, and the realization process is the fifth. Many Mansions is the book that deals with the reincarnation aspect of that. Gina Sermonara. C-E-R-M-I-N-A-R-A. And there are just a few copies of it back there on the table, which are available if anyone wants those. Um, in terms of... You know, I mean, what I presented... Um, either doesn't make much sense or looks like it's a framework that might just pull everything together in a very neat way. For those of you who think the latter and would like to find something, some books to pursue it on, um, one thing which I'll have to do is give you my address and I'll send you a bibliography that has some of the books that I based all of this on. And let me give you that right now. You already know my name, and you just have to write to me at John F. Kennedy University, Orinda, O-R-I-N-D-A, California, 94563. The single two books that helped me really organize that material the clearest and are the most systematic accounts of all of this kind of thing that I've been describing. Uh, the more difficult one, but the more important one also, is a book called God Speaks by Meher Baba. M-E-H-E-R-B-A-B-A. And there's one copy on the back table if anyone wants to look through it. And it includes all kinds of charts that help really put together each of those different five processes. And the other one, which is much easier reading um, and is, has a lot more practical implications, because that book is a, is a cosmology and it just goes into the mechanics of how consciousness develops through the creation. The other one are the Discourses, also by Meher Baba. Now, there are other traditions that go through the same material, and that's what I have on my reading list, if any of you want to see how other traditions also deal with the same, but this, the material by Mayor Baba is, it's modern and it's, it's the most systematic study that I've seen that deals with this, this type of thing. Yes? Would we see the same kind of process reflected in the um, Jewish? Yes, in Kabbalic thought, I mean, it's exactly the same. Um, it's remarkable how exactly it is. The Kabbalistic teaching, and I've 
sometimes I remember and sometimes I don't the terms that are used. There's the, um, oh, I'm not remembering. But it starts off with the one, and it goes into the, the manifestation, and then the reincarnational process, and then the return back to God. And it's this very same pattern. And you find it in Buddhism, you find it in Hinduism, you find it in Sufism, you find it in Christian mysticism, at least the esoteric aspects of Christian mysticism, uh, and you find it in Hasidic and Kabbalistic teaching. And it's uh, just incredible that it's all there, and yet in our educational system, where is it? Uh, it's just phenomenal. Yes? Have you done any writing yourself? Um, the only thing that I've... Well, I've done a couple of articles. The only thing that I've put together is a little book that's also back there called Understanding Death from a Spiritual Perspective, which deals with the moment of death to the moment of rebirth and charts out what I've been able to figure out from the research and readings I've done, studies I've done, what the different phases are there. Because just as in the physical plane, there are developmental phases from infancy, childhood, and so forth, in the same way, when we drop the body and go through the astral, there are also very specific phases there. And so what I did was I kind of charted what those are about. Um, I've just recently gotten a grant to put a lot more of that material together in a, in a larger book, and so I'll be doing that, but that's all I've done so far. I've been too busy developing a uh, university program to have time for my own writing. Yes? Yeah, sure. I don't want to minimize the importance of what you're saying, but I had one other thing which I wanted to do, which I think is important, which is that in light of what I've just described, to talk about the um, opportunity that people see to get past life readings and hypnotic <coughs> regression, uh, and I'd like to put all of those two kinds of things, which a lot of people are drawn to, in the context that I've been presenting. Um, The desire to get confirmation about whether or not reincarnation is true by having one's own experience. At first it was by having a psychic reading and seeing whether it would work, and now it's by reliving some past life memories, uh, is a very understandable one. And we live in an empirical age where the experience is the proof. And so I can really sympathize and I can understand the desire and the temptation of going to someone to be regressed to find out about a past life or or whatever there are certain kinds of psychological and physical dangers that are involved in that but i don't want to talk about those because those will can be debated by people who know more about hypnotism than i do and the pros and cons of allowing oneself to be hypnotized and then regressed I'll leave to whoever wants to deal with it at that level. Uh, I'm not qualified to. What I can look at, though, is whether that kind of activity serves the spiritual purpose that we're here for. And it's a very interesting thing that if you look at the whole thing of regression or past life readings from that perspective, you get some very interesting perspectives on all of this stuff, a lot of which is happening right here at this conference. One thing that you get is that if someone wants to do something, there's no way to inhibit it. And part of the whole opportunity we have through reincarnation is to do whatever we really feel driven to do and then to see the consequences of it, to learn from that, for good or for bad, and then to keep on going and keep up the learning. So from one point of view, if you're driven or tempted or curious, well, that's just part of what you're going to experience and you can learn from whatever you can from it. There's another point of view, though, which is significant enough to at least throw into the hopper in making the decision about whether or not to do this. And that has to do with what constitutes spiritual growth. Particularly in relation to the sorts of information that can come through with knowing about past lives. 
And let me describe what I mean. First, let me describe what I consider to be a valid or positive use of this kind of information. There are several people up at the university or associated with Kennedy, but one of whom is a, a very fine psychic reader, another of whom is a psychiatrist who does regression occasionally, who have found that in certain kinds of clinical situations, where there is someone who is in a really bad pathological, psychological state and where therapy has not helped deal with the problem, that gaining information either through a past life reading or through a regression can unlock the, the door to helping that person get their stuff together psychologically in this lifetime. And I know enough cases of where that has happened to not be altogether down on the use of either past life readings or regression when it's handled in a clinical setting by truly qualified people who know what they're doing and who are doing it as part of their clinical work. And when it's used in that way, I think that there's every reason to believe that there is some real spiritual value to the service that both the psychic is providing or the therapist is providing and to the person being able to untangle their stuff by using this information. On the other hand, that's the positive part, on the other hand, If you remember what I said, I said that the point of spiritual development, or not the point, but the dynamics of spiritual development, is to learn how to turn inward to our own deep source of wisdom, of knowledge, of understanding in living our lives. To get deeper and deeper into our own intuitional understanding. We have already, in any given situation, no matter how confusing or distressing, we have already within ourselves the knowledge of how to deal with that situation. We don't go into any given lifetime without everything we need in order to handle the events of that lifetime. So in a given lifetime, if we're faced with a dilemma, or a problem, or a situation, we have within ourselves, within reach, the knowledge, the intuition of how to handle it. And what we continue to do to ourselves because this is the only way to grow, is to put ourselves in situations that demand us to go one step deeper into ourselves if we're going to unravel it for ourselves. In other words, we're always going a little bit too deep into the water. Because only by doing that are we going to force ourselves to tread water a little bit longer or to dive down a little bit deeper. And the whole process of spiritual growth is to keep diving deeply within to find that source of self-understanding, self-knowledge. The intuition that will tell us this is what needs to be done in this situation. What happens, both with past life readings from a psychic and from regression, is that that process is short-circuited. Instead, of relying on forcing. And look, it's not easy. I mean, you know, no one said that spirituality is fun or is the easy way to deal with situations. But what happens is that instead of forcing ourselves to have to go deeper into ourselves, we then can deal with the information we get from the psychic either at a cognitive level or the regression becomes information that comes up 
that we again deal with in terms of the information instead of in terms of the intuition. And in one sense, you know, John of the Cross, St. John of the Cross talked about the dark night of the soul. In one sense, spiritual development is going into a darkness, into a, a loss of understanding, because intuition may not know all the reasons for this or that. But the intuition, that wisdom, is what we have to kind of tune in on, and it's our radar back home. From a spiritual point of view, to find out about past lives allows us to deal with situations at a level that in one sense is easier or less demanding spiritually of us than the level that we should be, let me put it this way, than the level that the situation is there to enable us to attain. Yes. How about when you get um, memories of past lives that come really spontaneously? Okay, now when memories come spontaneously, that's a whole other thing. And if they're spontaneous past life memories, that means that that information is information that is part of that growth process, and it means you can know how to deal with it. And for the most part, it's okay. Sometimes, though, even when it comes spontaneously, if it comes spontaneously because of having used some grass or having used some drugs or opening up this way or opening up that way, then it can be very unbalancing. But if it's really a spontaneous memory, then that's, that's fine. Now let me just say one last thing about intuition versus information in terms of past lives. <clears throat> this is subtle, but I think the point can be, can be made. In working out karma, the point of working through a karmic situation is to see what is the right thing to do in that situation. The lesson that's being learned is how to be in that kind of situation and how to act in that kind of situation from a perception of what is demanded by the situation. To get karmic information, to get past life information, and to be told in such and such a relationship it's a karmic tie and you've got to stay with that person at least five years, or whatever the kind of information might be, if what that can do is make there to be a shift of motivation, and instead of remaining in the situation because, in fact, it's the right thing to do, one doesn't do that, one remains because we've been told that it's a karmic thing. So that instead of doing what is right by the situation, we start doing what's right by a kind of spiritual self-interest. Right? I want to undo my karma. And so what I'm going to do, if I'll, you know, it's a, it's a spiritual ego trip, to do what's in the self-interest, you've been told that it's a karmic thing, so you'll do that because it's karma, not because it's right. And it's a very subtle distinction. But if we do something, if we do something for the wrong motivation, even if on the surface level, the behavior level, it's the quote-unquote right thing to do, it does not release the karma. <coughs> And so, when dealing with all of these kinds of things, a real understanding of what spirituality is about is real important in order to come to decisions as to what kind and how much information we want to really get about these various sorts of things. Now, obviously, you know, if somebody has a regression experience and they spend five minutes kind of seeing a few flickers of past life things and that's a convincing thing, that reincarnation is really there, fine. But in terms of really getting hung up or thinking that one needs past life readings or one needs periodic regressions to figure out what to do in this lifetime, that's a real trap. And I've seen an awful lot of people fall into that trap because it becomes so easy to call the psychic and it becomes easier the better the psychic is. Right? It's not just a trap if you have kind of a sideshow psychic. But I've seen with the woman that I work with, 
who is an excellent psychic, that people who get readings from her keep on wanting readings from her periodically to kind of confirm what they're doing and become dependent on that outside validation instead of just growing in trust in terms of one's own intuition. So having said that, I don't know about reincarnation as it is or the true picture or whatever they build this as, but that's what I had to present for today. And I'll take a couple of questions because the time man hasn't come back in yet. The thing is that the, the dependency with all of these things, whether it's drugs or a regression technique or the idea of regression or psychic reading, the dependency is very subtle. It doesn't have to mean that you really go and get the psychic reading periodically or get regressed or take the drug. What it means is that there is a thought in your consciousness that this is something that would be valuable or I can always rely on it or I can always fall back on it. Thank you. <laughs> Five minutes. That you can always rely on it. And the dependency can be purely at a very subtle thought and feeling level that you may not even be conscious of, a kind of holding on to that as something to hold on to. And very often you're not even realizing that that's what's going on. So it gets real subtle. Yes? What is Sufism? Sufism is the mystical tradition from that has its roots in the Middle East, and it's one of the major mystical paths. Um, and I'm not sure, I don't think I have anything uh, about Sufism in the back there, but... Uh, there's from a, India, or...? It's from the Middle East. It's, it's the, the tradition of Jewish, Christian, and Islamic mysticism is all Sufi, that one strand of Sufic mysticism. Oh, yes, very good question. The question was, the involutionary process and the realization process what form are we in when that's going on? Are we in the physical or are we in some kind of other plane of, of existence? The answer in every esoteric tradition is that we have to be embodied in order to go through the planes of consciousness in the spiritual path and the state of enlightenment or union with God. That, we, that our consciousness is evolving and so we're not, we're not in the same... We're not oriented toward the world in the same way, or toward our bodies in the same way, but we cannot progress unless we are in the body. So, it's right here, folks. And there's no escaping it. This is where it's got to be. <laughs> what a question. What is the most useful tool? The most useful tool? Well... Intuition, love? I think that what it comes down to uh, in a way, intuition and love are the same thing. Yeah. Intuition tells you how to use your love. And intuition, in one sense, is applying love in specific situations. Because it's one thing to have as a principle to love. But if you're in a situation, you can say, well, is doing this loving or is doing that loving? Right? Doesn't that come up a lot? Where like, you want to love, we all know that. But what, in a given situation, what, do you, what is the loving thing to do? And that's where intuition becomes the application of love to life. And finally, the real thing that is the beacon, which is the, you know, again, in every tradition, the one safe thing is to keep one's eye on God and on the manifestation or incarnation of God that one is most drawn to. Whether in the East that would be Krishna or Rama or the Buddha, or in the West it's Jesus. Understanding and the love that the avatar comes to share, um, in one sense, that's the beacon, that's the, the light that leads back. Well, I think that our time person has returned with the, the final note. I want to thank you all for your attention. Thank you. Thank you.